Well, welcome everybody to 2012 Get Organized Challenge, Stamps, Punches, and Cutting Systems. And I really apologize. This is challenge number six in your book. And I apologize for sort of getting things out of sync in, in the workbook um, this time. So in the next round, I'll do a better job of following my own instructions. So, uh, But this is one of the most challenging areas of organization because the size and shapes and all that kind of stuff. So welcome, and I think you'll find a lot of great ideas here that just build on the ideas that we've been um, talking about in the past um, six challenges. So with that, let's just jump right in. First of all, this week's winner, Tracy Speck Sands, and um, she just is, has made huge progress um, of where she's going and, and what's going on. And so just a good job, great, Tracy, good to hear. Glad that you're posting up and getting so much done. So Tracy receives a $25 scrap rack gift certificate. Um, and if you don't get an email from me, Tracy, that means I don't have your email address. So please feel free to email me at customer service and I will get your coupon code right out to you. So congratulations, Tracy. All right, the 2000 member celebration. Well, as many of you know, we did a celebration for a thousand members. And then when we got close to the 2000 member mark, we started talking about how we we're going to celebrate that. Well, we just blew right by 2000 members and now we're up to 2190 members. And so there was a couple of different suggestions made. One of them was to give everybody a 20% off coupon um, for the celebration for a limited amount of time. And so I thought that was kind of a cool idea, and that way everybody got something. Um, and But this is what I came up with. We're going to do 20% off your entire Scrap Rack brand product order for 2,190 minutes. So that translates to 36 and a half hours. Um, and the order that pushes us past the $2,190 sales mark, will get their order paid for up to $219. So if you order $50 worth of stuff that day, you're going to get all of it for free. If you order $500 worth of stuff that day and you're the winner, then you're going to get, you know, $300, and you're going to get uh, $219 of free. So your $500 order will be $281. So I hope that all makes sense, how I'm sort of tying in the $2,190 to everything. Um, the coupon code is 2000 um, for 365. So um, that's 20% off for 36 and a half hours is the code. I'll post it on the Get Organized Challenge page, and I'll also um, send it out in the email that goes out this afternoon once we have everything done. So the coupon sales, everybody has a few days to think about it and what they need, if they need anything. The coupon sale is going to start at 2 a.m. on March 2nd. I'm trying to stick with that 2 theme you see here and conclude at 2.30 p.m. on March 3rd, and that is Eastern Time, everybody. And again, so um, the, the it's 20% off. If we exceed $2,190 in sales, the order that pushed us over that mark is going to get $219 in product in their order for free. So, and there's the code. And yes, even if you already use your Get Organized Challenge coupon code, you can use this coupon code. However, you cannot apply this coupon code to any previous orders. It is strictly limited to that 36 and a half hours and to Scrap Rec brand products um, during that time. So I will post on the Facebook page and send it out in the email. And then we, yeah, I will send out an email um, when it starts as well. Like a, so you'll get an email that says the, the sale is on. So just kind of to remind you. All right. So thank you for the suggestions on that. That's sort of what drove my idea here to do this was what you guys suggested on the Facebook page. So now let's get really started with this webinar. So our goal for this webinar is to establish a system for sorting, storing, and organizing your stamps, punches, and cutting systems that enables you to get the most out of them with the least frustration, right? That's a common theme that's been flowing through this whole series is how can we get the best use out of these products with the least amount of frustration? So the challenge comes with organizing these things because of all the different shapes and sizes that they come in. So whether it's a wood-mounted stamp, a Cricut cartridge, a, a, you know, um, acrylic stamp, Cynthia die cuts, all of those things, cuddle bug, embossing folders, all those different sizes. And you would think that they all require different organization methods, but they really don't. Um, they might require different storage containers. But what they, they need, you need to follow the same system that we've been establishing this whole time, right? You're training your brain 
how to find your stuff. So you want to stick with this four-section system because you know that it works and you know that it's easy to find. So here we are with that. Are you a got a little or a got a lot? So you have determined earlier in the series which of these things you were. Maybe you're different for these particular items that you're got a little for supplies, but you're got a lot for stamps or vice versa. So got a littles are going to have a few of a variety of the things. Um, so if you're got a little, you have stuff, um, you like the stuff, but you're not likely to accumulate large amounts of it. You're more likely to use products available at your local scrapbook store when you go to the crop. Got a lot love to have everything. They love to share everything, and they love to have the latest and greatest stuff and share it with their crop pals, and their crop pals almost rely on them to bring this stuff or have this stuff or expose them to the new stuff. So whichever you are, you kind of need to determine that. Now, some of us are somewhere in the middle. And if that's the case, then you can choose either of the two different sort of storage methods that we're going to talk about as we go through here. Oops, I flipped my thing back. So got a littles need to integrate product representations, and in some cases, the actual products right into their four-section system. Got a lots will need to create a standalone catalog to keep with your four-section system. So when we talk about representation, if you're got a little, especially. You'll create representations of each of the things you have and put the representations directly into your four-section system. So as an example here, we have this birthday gift box stamp, right? Well, this, or I guess not a birthday gift, it's just a gift stamp. And it can fit in a variety of categories. I've listed a few of them here, like birthday, Christmas, Hanukkah, wedding. I'm sure there's other things that you can come up with. But in this case, if you think this stamp is going to fit in six categories, you're going to make six impressions of the stamp. Now, um, you're going to number the stamp, the die cut, or the punch. So you're going to do the same thing, whether it's a wood-mounted stamp, um, some sort of die cut, or um, a punch. So in this case, this becomes number 15, this little this little box stamp, number 15. You're going to write the number, in this case, the stamp number on the impressions. You're going to separate the impressions and put one impression into each of the categories where it belongs. Then you're going to store the stamp in its proper place, and we'll talk about where that is in a few minutes. So the idea is that you have this little gift box stamp, and it has a number 15 on it, and you're going to put one example in birthday, and you're going to put one example in Christmas, and one example in Hanukkah, and one example in baby, and wedding, and graduation. So when you're working on pages or cards that have to do with that theme or category, and you're looking through your supplies, boom, there's the impression of that stamp, and it's stamp number 15. So if you want to use the stamp, you know exactly where to go to get the stamp, you go to the drawer that's labeled stamp numbers 1 through 20. You pull out stamp number 15. You use it when you're done. You put the stamp back in the drawer. It's just that simple. The other thing about having these examples in your four-section system, especially if you're using a scrap rack, is that if you go to a crop, you don't have to take all your stamp. Because you have the example of the stamp in there, and you have the exact size of it. Now, when I first started doing this, I just stamped out my stamps onto little scrap pieces of paper and put that little square of paper into the pocket, right? Well, um, a few years ago, one of the people in my class said to me, you should cut out around the stamp, and that way when you're, you know, at a crop or something, you can take the stamp out. You can actually lay that little sample stamp right on your layout and build around it so you know exactly the size and shape of it or how you're going to layer it or whatever. So that worked really, really well. So um, you might want to cut out around the stamp so you have the exact Size and how it's going to look on your page. Then just put a sticky note there that says, when I get home, you know, use stamp number 15 at home. And then when you get home, you can finish the layout or the card or whatever you were working on, but you haven't had to haul your, um, your stamps, your inks, your embossing stuff, all that stuff with you, and yet you're getting the value of having that stamp or punch or whatever it is because you've been able to use that example. So here's some, this is a Stampin' Up! set. Um, I use SU to indicate Stampin' Up! as a brand. Now, Stampin' Up! comes in those nice clamshells. They're small. They're easy to store. This happens to be Stampin' Up! number five. So I photocopied the stamp set rather than stamping it out. That's another option. Um, it uh, takes a little bit longer on the um, copier, but um, you don't have to clean all the stamps before you put them away. So it's kind of a toss-up there. And you can make as many copies as you need. So the happy birthday stamp <clears throat> might just go in birthday, whereas the, you know, the wine stamps or the bon appetit stamps, they might go 
in home and family or cooking or, you know, whatever different, um, you know, you might put Bon Appetit, a copy of that in your Words of Wisdom section so that you remember that you have that stamp or whatever. So you just make as many copies of it as you think that your categories that you're going to fit those into. Okay, so why are we numbering, right? What happened to just putting things into the four-section system? Numbering things like stamps and punches and cricket, et cetera, prevents constantly rearranging to fit like products into the correct area. So um, what I mean by that is if you have drawers full of stamps and you have, your, and you have them grouped um, alphabetically by theme, so you have a drawer full of baby stamps, and then right below that, a drawer full of beach stamps, and then, and then right below that, a drawer full of birthday stamps. Well, your, if your beach stamp drawer is full, in order to keep things in order, now you've got to totally rearrange all those beach stamps or the birthday drawer below or the baby drawer above to, so that you can keep things in order. So you spend all this time rearranging or adding more boxes or containers that might not fit or rearranging, moving things around your room. Well, once you put things in numerical order, you don't have to do that. So if you buy a new beach stamp and you already have 199 stamps, and that's a beach ball stamp. You take that beach ball stamp and you make it number, stamp number 200. And you stamp out as many beach balls. So you might have a beach ball for sports. You might put a beach ball in, obviously, beach. You might put a uh, beach ball in bath time or under boys or under summer or wherever it's going to go, however many impressions you need. And you label all of them 200. And then you take that beach ball stamp and it goes in the last drawer that's labeled, you know, stamp number 190 to whatever, in this case it would be 200, um, so you always know where to find it. When you see that beach ball stamp, you know exactly where to go to get it, but you're not ever, you don't have to rearrange all your stamps to make them all, to put them, to work them in alphabetically. So um, numbering allows you that fast, easy access when you need to find something, and it makes it really easy to put things away in their proper place, too. Now remember, one of the things that happens when when you're in the situation where you have to rearrange things or work things in, is that you end up setting something aside. You're like, well, I would put this beach stamp away, but it's not going to fit in the drawer, so I need to wait now until I have time to rearrange my drawers and put that stamp in. And so that new stamp that you got ends up going into a pile or a drawer or a bin or a basket or on a shelf in a closet or somewhere where it inevitably gets buried by something else and then you don't see it again until you uncover everything in that closet. So remember, one of our goals of this organization system is that as we add new things to um, our supplies, we're able to put them away right away so that we're able to start using them and getting the benefit of having them right away. So again, you just want to be able to take care of it quickly and easily. We talked a couple of sessions ago about keeping some supplies handy, scraps of paper, scrap rack pages, ink, all the basic things that you might need to um, integrate something new into your system. So this would be perfect. You got that new beach stamp, you stamp it out four or five times, get it a number, put it away. The whole process will take you three to five minutes, depending on how many impressions you have. But you'll actually be able to find that beach ball stamp and use that beach ball stamp immediately instead of waiting to uncover it later from the, your buried pile on your desk. So for God a lot, you're going to create your catalog um, label and then store. So creating a catalog that's an actual standalone catalog for your stuff is the way to go. Your catalog is going to follow the four section system. It's actually only three sections because we don't have um, a rainbow section for this. Um, but the catalog can easily be transported to crops, taken on shopping trips, um, all of those kinds of things. So it makes it simple to buy products that complement rather than duplicate what you already own. So step one is to decide your catalog format. And you can use either a 12 by 12 format or 8 and a half by 11. And then just do basic things, paper, page protectors, pull reinforcers, tab dividers, same things you would use to create any kind of notebook. If you've got a little, um, OK, so step two is, is, to, is to gather. So if you've got a little, you should bring all your stamps and punches, et cetera, together in one place at one time. But if you've got a lot, you might want to start with one type of product and bring all of those things together because you have so many of the products. You don't want to overwhelm yourself again. So bring all those products together. You're going to work in small groups just like we've done all the way through the series. So now you've got to make some storage decisions. How and where are you going to store your sorted items? Get those items together. So if you need boxes or scrap rack pages or drawers or shelves or whatever it is, and again, you want to prepare an organized-only space for the sorted items so that as you start to sort and organize them, 
then you are um, able to put them away where you can find them and get to them easily. So the other thing that you might want to consider if you've got a lot is creating some codes for things. So you saw my Stampin' Up set, right, that I use the SU to categorize Stampin' Up. So you've got different things. Some of these may apply to you. Some of them may not. You'll have to create your own. But depending on the kinds of products that you have, you might want to come up with a code list so that you can be consistent. Now, this is one of those things that you really need to do first if you've got a lot. Because what happens is you'll get halfway through the process and then you think, you think, I don't need that. I don't need the code list. I can remember everything. But you'll get halfway through the process and you'll think, okay, so I was uh, labeling close to my heart and CH, right? And then you go away and you do something else. And when you come back, you can't remember, was I using CH? No, I was using CTMH. And so you start labeling things differently. So just by creating that themes list and giving yourself a guideline and creating the list of things that are going into albums. Take a few minutes to come up with your codes list first, post it on the wall or a bulletin board or something where you can easily see it so that you can use it because it will make a difference as you go through the process. Okay, so got a lots are going to start the process by going through one container at a time and stamping, punching, copying, etc. onto catalog sheets and coding and numbering the products and the representations. When you're finished, label the containers where you've stored the catalog items with the correct numbers. So um, I've got a picture here of what I'm talking about is catalog sheet. The catalog sheets are going to follow your themes, um, your seasons, your four-section system essentially without the rainbow section. So here's an example of, um, or two different examples. One's done on 12 by 12, the yellow background one of the animals category. You can see on that one. So there's stamps on there, and they're just acrylic stamps. They were photocopied and just cut out and put on there. And so you've got um, the numbers there, and they're on the animals tab, and that's the 12 by 12. And then in the smaller one, you see another catalog, and it's open to the ocean page. So it shows all the stamps and punches that relate um, to ocean, and that one's done just on 8.5 by 11. Now, you see this little palm tree stamp on that on that page, and that palm tree is on, uh, under ocean, and if you had a vacation section, you would probably stamp it under vacation. Um, if you had a nature section, you'd probably stamp it under nature. So, and it's number five, I think. I don't, I can't really see the number, but that same number five would be on all of those pages, and when you needed that woodblock stamp, number five, you would go to your woodblock drawer, open drawer that's labeled one through 20, pull out number five. Here's the other thing about labeling woodblocks. I write the number on the top of the stamp and on all four sides of the woodblock stamp. And that way it doesn't matter how I put the stamp in to the box because you'll be able to stand your stamps up rather than lay them flat. So, you, you know, you don't have to see the pictures on all of them when you switch to this numbering thing. So that really condenses down a lot of space, too. So you get way more efficient and you get more space. And But then it doesn't matter how you put the stamp away because no matter what side you stand it up on, you can see the number label on that side. So that's really helpful. All right. So now here's an example of an, an unmounted stamp catalog. So you saw that um, that yellow page that said animal. So this is done in a scrap rack, um, on a scrap rack binder. It's all acrylic unmounted stamps. Each one of the little number tabs there represents the first digit or digits of the code um, and they're by size. So let's see. Let's open it up here so you can see. So you can see here, so these would be under the tab label 16. This is new. I guess the previous picture said 12 on it. And that was when we had the dream buzz. And now we have the sweet 16. So these would be in pockets that were labeled 16107 and 16108. This would be labeled under the tab 6. And what that does is it just tells me that that's a six pocket page or 16 pocket page. So the first digit tells me that's a sweet 16 or that's a perfect six page. And those things are determined by the size of the stamp. That allows you the maximum efficiency for filling those pockets. So if you try to put pages in to your stamp um, collection by theme, and you have one little small stamp or three little small stamps, one medium-sized stamp and one large stamp. Now you've got um, empty pockets all over the place. But another benefit to switching to the number thing is everything goes in by size and gets a number, goes into the catalog. So if I want to use stamp number 16101, 
I go to the tab that's numbered 16. Behind it is all the Sweet 16 pocket pages that I've got. And they're just numeric through there. And I can go flip right through and find exactly the pocket number that I need. And that's a little convoluted and cumbersome. So I hope it makes sense. You definitely can ask more questions as we go through. So here's um, just my Stampin' Up! stamps and my Close to My Heart stamp. And um, those are just, again, in, in a basket with a number. So this Stampin' Up! basket holds Stampin' Up! kits number one through nine. Close to my heart, I only have one basket of, of them, so there's no number on it now. If I moved up to another um, basket of those, then I would put a number on that basket as well that said what was in there. But you can see I've just taken that um, a file folder tab and labeled my kit. And so I don't have to see the whole kit. I know if I'm looking for something from that voila, uh, it's stamping up number five, I can go right to the basket, pull out set number five, and it's right there. So it just really makes it simple when they're tied into the catalog and they're done by numbers. So these little clamshells that um, Stampin' Up! uses are a great tool in general for storage. And I know that they do sell them at um, Michaels and Joanne in different sizes. They're fairly inexpensive, but they're not only a great way to store stamps, but they're a good way to store anything that normally you would have to like layer into a drawer or whatever. Well, this allows you to stand things up on a shelf. So I think we talked a little bit about it when we did, you know, the color um, webinar that you could fill one of these clamshells with reds and one with blues and one with greens or whatever of colored things. And then again, be really easy to just take out what you needed. Okay, so another option is to use um, the photo storage box and the photo files. So the new photo storage box and files, because they're slightly oversized, work really good for stamps or nestabilities or even embossing folders. You're going to see more of that as you go through. So you'll still want to add examples of these items into your four-section system and your catalog sheet, but you just number the photo storage boxes. So this would be stamps number one through ten or whatever. And then you can use the file folders to put the different, the unmounted stamps on their acetate or their um, plastic sheets in those um, file folders. So I'm going to do a little video on how that all works um, later. But the file folders then would correspond with the, um, the numbers on the examples. There's a bunch of different options out there for Cricut. Um, so the Cricut case, I think a lot of you have Seen. This is in the Cool Tools section on our website, but this holds 16 um, cartridges and books and, and tools. Now, um, there's also a little video on our website because, again, I would number the tray that these um, Cricut cartridges are in, 1 through 16, and I would number the box if you have more than 16 Cricut cartridges, which I know a lot of you do. Um, so this box would be 1 through 16, and the next box would be 17 through 32. But you, when you take out that, and then write the number on the Cricut cartridge itself. So if you take out Cricut cartridge number 12 and book number 12 and you use it, when you're done with it, you know exactly which box to go to to put it away. The same thing when you're labeling your Cricut cartridge example in your section, in your four section system. So let's say one of these is a travel um, cartridge. So you would label that travel cartridge, you know, Cricut cartridge number 12. Um, and you put the example of the, all the things that are in that, like a photocopy of the back of the box works great, um, in your travel section. So when you're working on travel, there it is, that little example of what's on the Cricut cartridge pops up. And so you know what's on it, and you can go right to where it's stored in that box and take it out and use it. So that's a great way to go. Um, the, this is another Cricut storage option, the book. Um, we used to carry them. I don't carry them anymore because they're so expensive. But they're really cool and they're really well made. They're available on the internet. Same thing though, you want to number those pockets. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. This happens to hold 36 cartridges and booklets all in that one big binder. Um, another option for Cricut cartridge storage is to just put them on Velcro um, on a um, divider page. So you put this adhesive Velcro on the divider page and a little dot of Velcro on the back of each cartridge. And then you can stick the cartridges right to the divider page, and you can have a ton of cartridges. Now, carrying the books with this um, system requires that you put your books into, like, a Rubbermaid tote or something and take that along with you as well. But the same thing, number the book, number the cartridge, so you can pull things together quickly and easily that way. Um, I was going to say something else quickly about this, and I don't 
can't remember exactly what it was. But this is a great way to take a lot of cartridges with you. Um, and you can see you can even do it double double sided on that one page. Oh, with the books. Um, so I know some people like to keep everything, keep their box and the books and the overlays and everything in the box. Um, it's a little bit cumbersome to do that, but you can number the boxes and find them easily as well. If you like to travel with your stuff, um, if you in the book they have all the foreign language section, and someone suggested a couple webinars ago that you go in and remove all the foreign language section from the book, and that makes the books only about half as thick. So you can carry around a lot more books with useful information in them. Now, the one caveat to that is somebody else said, well, I usually sell my cartridges after a while or whatever. So if you're going to sell your cartridges after a while, you may not want to take apart the book, and you may not want to toss out the box. Um, so just kind of keep those things in mind. Some of us will never sell our cartridges, so you don't have to worry about it. But other people who sort of trade up and switch around, you might want to keep all those things together. So, keep them in mind. so here's some examples of if you're keeping the Cricut boxes together. So um, see, this gal did Cricut Alphabet. So it was Cricut Alphabet 101. Um, and then there's uh, CT is um, Cricket. I don't remember what the T means. Uh, I don't remember. But um, and then and they're just in order. So she's got the two color groups separated um, and numbered differently, so she can reference them that way. Personally, I would just give every Cricket cartridge a number and um, not worry about the you know, keeping them together by color or by theme or by um, what sort of templates in them. Is it alphabet or is it icon? Um, because, again, you have to constantly rearrange things and work things in. And if you just number them straight across and give everything a, a consecutive number, then it's easy to just put your newest thing at the end of the line and keep moving forward with that. So in terms of punch storage, um, the numbers in the catalog, in this catalog, match the numbers on the drawers. So if you wanted this, um, these little butterfly stamps, they're gonna, you're gonna find those in drawer number 11. I don't know if you can see in your screen or not the little numbers that are just written on the drawer fronts here. So this is just an example. This gal actually has hundreds of punches. And she started initially putting the pictures on the front of them and then got to the point where she found herself constantly rearranging to work new punches in. And that's when she switched over to numbering and the catalog system um, after taking one of our classes. And she, when she did the catalog for herself, she made a, ca a catalog at the same time for me so I could have this to show people at classes. But So she went from that exact situation of constantly rearranging to keep things together to switching over to numbers. And so you can see a lot of her things are still in, in group order because that's how they were originally and just her new things that end up being mixed a variety of products in there, a variety of things mixed in there, but really easy to find. Just go to drawer number 11, grab the butterfly stamps or um, the flower stamps, whatever drawer they're in. It's just simple. Okay, so you want to start a catalog page even if you only have one thing that fits that category. So in this example, this is a stamp, um, just stamps, but she's got lots of party stamps, and she's got the numbers there for where she can find those party stamps. But she only had one sports stamp. And the temptation when she was working on this was to not start a sports section because she just had one sports stamp. But you really want to, in your catalog, even if you only have one thing that fits that theme, you really want to start that. We talked about that and when we're, when we're sorting supplies as well. There's a temptation to set that thing aside and wait till you have more things that fit that category. But just go ahead and start the category. And, um, and, and put the stamp or punch or whatever away where it belongs in the drawer. So you do the same thing with your cuddle bug embossing folder. Um, so just give the embossing folder a number. So you can see there's the four leaf bricks, music notes, whatever they are. So the embossing folders have all been given a number. The pockets have been given a number. And so the embossing folders are just right in the pocket. When you, read it, when you want to use them, you just go right to that pocket. And um, you're able to find exactly what you need, again, and you're able to put it away quickly and easily. So things like um, the, the music notes um, embossing thing, those might, that might go, you might make several of those and put them in different, like under party, you might put them under marching band if you have kids in band, 
You might put it under a wedding, anywhere that music notes might be appropriate or numbers or bricks or whatever. And you might also have a section that just has all the examples of those things in it. So um, we talked a little bit about like words of wisdom. You might, because these are so generic, the wood and the brick and the forgery and the music notes, this could be used in so many different places that you might keep a section in the back of your scrap rack that's just all the examples that you have that are really generic things as well. But definitely work in things that work with the theme, work in that example. So the numbers, obviously you're going to put that under birthday. You might put the numbers thing under school. So, so and then here's the example of the smaller cuddle bug. Um, I'm sorry, this picture's a little bit blurry. But again, just in the Sweet 16 pocket pages, you have those little cuddle bugs, all um, easy to find, laid out, visible. But you're going to have examples of all of those things in the category where they might belong. So the camping tent, obviously, is going to be in camping. And the stars are going to go in a variety of sections, right? So stars could be used. They could be used in camping. They could be used in awards. They could be used in school. They can be used in, you know, um, I don't know, any kind of celebration sort of event or uh, New Year's Eve or anything like that. So you just want to um, make sure that you're representing them in as many categories as they might fit. Okay, so this week's challenge is to catalog 20 things a day for the next seven days. So that's 140 items over the course of the next week. So, um, and then continuing the process. So you can continue through the process by doing a little each week until everything is cataloged. Or you can catalog things as you use them, or you can do both things. Now, there's some things that you want to think about as you're doing this. There's two kind of thoughts on this catalog as you use. And the first thought is that if I'm cataloging as I'm using things, then at the end of six months or a year, I'll know what things I never use, and that'll be easier for me to purge them out. But then the, other, the flip side of that is I didn't use it because it wasn't in my catalog, so I didn't remember that I had it. And if I would have remembered that I had it, then I would have used it. So I'm going to recommend that you kind of take on both things, that you, you know, whenever you have time to um, continue the process and do a little bit of work, you might have a half an hour and you say, okay, I, you know, I'm going to do these next stamps now and add them to my catalog. But then whenever you're working on something and you think, oh, I need that birthday stamp, and it hasn't been cataloged yet, and you dig it out from wherever it is, at that point you use it on your project, and you also put it in wherever else it might fit in your four-section system, give it a number, and put it away in that in numerical order. So by doing both things, um, you're moving forward um, on the same plan, the same system for organization. I hope that makes sense to everybody. All right, now, so I'm going to open up the question panel, um, and I'm sure this is always one of the more challenging um, webinars. So let me make my question panel a little bit larger here. I know that creates a black box on your guys' screen, so I'm sorry about that. Hopefully they're going to get that fixed soon. Let's go to webinar. Um, Merle, Merle's here. Welcome, Merle. Um, I don't know if any of you are from the Portland area, but we're going to be in Portland for the Portland show next week. And then Merle will be with me in Columbus, Ohio at the end of March. So if you're in the Columbus area, come and visit us. Um, Shelly has posted the Scrap Rack uh, new product suggestion link on the Get Organized Challenge Facebook page. Thank you, Shelly. Um, oh, and Tracy's here. Congratulations, Tracy. So if you want to send an email to customer service that says, send me my code, um, you can do that, and then we'll get it right over to you. Um, Denise is getting the exact same desk that um, I have at the uh, office, and it's just a great desk. It's lightweight. It's easy to move around. It was inexpensive, and I love the fact that um, that L shape to it. Sandy says, if we have our... If we have our one time 15% off, can we combine them? No, you cannot. Just either the 20% or the 15%. But I would definitely obviously recommend using the 20%, and then if you have forgotten anything or you need anything um, later, then you can use that 15% for that next order. So you really do get the benefit of both of them. Kamala says, I started organizing my stamp last week, but would you suggest that I stamp each one on a paper file so that I can remember what I have? Absolutely. You want to get it into that catalog. So whether you're a got a lot and you're going to have a standalone catalog 
or your gut a little, and you're going to stamp those impressions and put them right into your four-section system with the number, um, uh, you need to do one or the other. And I know some people will do both. Some people work all those impressions into their four-section system and also have a catalog. And the catalog is really helpful if you do a lot of close to my heart or Stampin' Up! or you're a regular shopper at the rubber stamp store because you can take that standalone catalog with you. And let's say you see a really cute new heart stamp and you buy it. You go, I, I, I love this heart stamp. I don't have a heart that's this size or shape. And when you get home, because you don't have the catalog with you, you realize not only do I have a stamp that's this size and shape, I have this exact same stamp. But if you can take that catalog with you, then you can go, oh, I need a bigger size or a smaller size, or oh, I already have 15 heart stamps. No matter how cute this is, I probably don't need another one. Let's move on to beach ball or whatever. So the catalog, if you're a frequent, same thing with Stampin' Up! and Close to My Heart, you're ordering those things from your rep. If you've got them all cataloged, then you're not going to order the same thing again or something really similar. You're going to be able to order something new and different that you that complements what you already have. Um, and Merle says to ha she needs her um, her own category called Gotta Too Matcha. <laughs> Very nice. You do, Merle. Okay, Glenda says, so are you saying that instead of arranging storing stamps that are by theme, you should store them in numerical order no matter what the heck the, the theme of each stamp? In other words, do you want us, for example, <clears throat> number stamps, clamshells, et cetera, numerically, and then put stamps 1 through 99 in one drawer, and then the next drawer 200 to 399, and so on. Yes, that's exactly what I'm advocating that you do. And that way you don't have to constantly rearrange things to add stuff to a theme. Um, so you don't have to rearrange the themes above or the themes before or the themes after. Now, most of us have started this whole process by organizing our stamps by theme. Um, so you're going to end up with big chunks of stamps all together by theme. Right? So all your Christmas stamps are already all together. So as you number those stamps, you know, if you have 100 Christmas stamps, you know, then it's going to be number 100 to number 199, and they're all Christmas in that block or area. So as you work through them, um, don't, you know, toss everything into a big box and start again, because you're going to want to put all your Christmas stamps onto the Christmas page in your catalog, right? So they're all grouped together, and they're all numbered together. But now when you buy a new Christmas stamp, if you if you're the you're at stamp number 405, now this Christmas stamp becomes 406. If it's a snowman, you stamp that snowman. You write 406 on the stamp. You write 406 on the impression. It goes in every category that it might fit in, and then it goes in the drawer that's now numbered at stamp number 400 plus. So it's a little bit cumbersome to think about, but once you start working with it. Um, it's really going to make sense to you, and it's going to make it so much easier because you don't have to rearrange things, and you don't have to dig through a hundred Christmas stamps to find the one you want because they all have numbers on them. You're going to go, okay, I want Christmas stamp number 125. You're going to open that drawer that's labeled 100, you know, through 150. You're going to pull out stamp number 125. You're not going to have to pull up every stamp and look at it to see what it is. Debbie asks, for Cricut, would you just photocopy the front of the book? to put it in the in the categories and number those. Absolutely. That's exactly, well, I don't know about the front of the book, I guess. Um, the, oh, the front page of the book, yes. So the page that shows all the little examples. And I think the back of the box, and some are different than others. Some show everything and some don't. But if you've got the back of the box, you know, I, I use them. I use the color copier to um, photocopy the Cricut boxes because I like having the color. I'm usually too cheap to use color printing on anything like that. But it was nice because you got more of the definition of the thing. So I actually photocopied the, the back of the box, um, and then I put that in. But you can do the same thing with the inside page that shows all the different components that are in there. Um, exactly. And most of those things are by theme, right? So. They're mostly for travel or for birthday or, you know, bugs or whatever it is. And so um, just getting you to the main category, Christmas or birthday party, is, is the key. The key is remembering that I have um, an appropriate cricket cartridge for this theme or event. And then how do I get there? And the number's going to take you there. Marla asked, what do you suggest for storing nestability sets? I tried CD cases inside a bin, but they are too hard to get to that way. So again, with the nestabilities, you can create a section of your catalog 
that's all nestabilities. Nestabilities, for the most part, tend to be frames and shapes and flowers and, and things like that, right? So, um, so if you create part of your category, part, part of your catalog is all nestabilities and a number, then you can do the same thing. Now, if you take, I'm sorry I didn't put a picture of it on here. If you take a piece of what's called magnetic canvas, and they sell it at Michael, and they sell it at hardware stores. At hardware stores, they sell it as, um, it's a magnetic sheet that goes over your floor vents or your heating vents, so that if you want to block off that heating vent, it sticks to it so air can't come through. And I think those are a little bit less expensive when you buy them that way than when you buy them at Michael. But anyway, it's a sheet of soft, pliable magnet. And um, you can stick your nestabilities right to it. There's actually a, either a video or an article on our website. And I'm going to make a note right here to include that link. Um, let me just write for a minute, link article nestability. Because you can actually put them in a scrap rack or in scrap rack pages. Um, on that on that piece of magnet, and it's, we show you how to do that in that article. Now, with that said, you can also take that piece of magnet, put your um, nestabilities on it, put them in a file. One of the use the photo storage box file folders, label the file folder, and then it's easy to find them because again, you're working by number. So if you have a nestability um, particular frame that you want to use. When you look at your nestability catalog, you see that frame. You see all the different sizes and shapes that it comes in, obviously, because they're nested together. And it's, and it's nestability number 101. You go to your box of nestabilities, go right back to the file folder that's labeled 101, pull it out, and there you've got it. You know exactly where to put it away. So because you're working off that catalog, the two things are tying together really quickly and easily. Also, with the catalog, Again, if you're at a proper class and you have that nestability catalog with the shapes cut out, you can build the layout using your sample nestability, um, your example that was in your catalog. And then when you go home, you can actually break out um, the spell binder and cut that nestability. So it works sort of all the same as stamps or punches or cricket or whatever. You don't actually have to have the item with you to actually get the use out of it. You just need some sticky notes. Um, Linda says, where at Inside Michaels or Joanne are these empty clamshells located? I've never seen these in either Michaels or Joanne. Um, sometimes they have them in the sewing section of Joanne. Obviously, Michaels doesn't have sewing. Um, but the, they are in, at, at our Joanne, here in Tacoma, they are in the scrapbooking section um, with other storage things. So like they have the white cube things and some other storage items for scrapbooking and they're in there. And they've probably been there all along and if you're not looking for them, you don't actually see them. But they also usually have them over in the sewing department and they're like $1.99 each or $1.29 each or something. They're not very expensive. Um, I may look for them and, and have them on our website. I think they're a really great tool for um, for being able to move things around and transport things in. And I especially think for wood mounted stamps, you can then you can stand your wood mounted stamps up and have maximum visibility with them um, as opposed to um, like just stacking them up. So Lori asks, what is the advantage of taking the Cricut cartridge and books for Cricut out of their original boxes? And the advantage to that is that you can get a whole bunch more of them in a whole lot less space. So, um, like putting them all on a on Velcro on a divider, or putting them all in the um, Cricut the box, um, you know, that has the cartridges on the left side and the books on the right. So, in, you've got 16 cartridges and 16 books in that slim little box, and um, so it's easy to take them with you, or it's easy to you know store them space wise, as opposed to having 16 boxes. So that one little Cricut box that holds the 16 cartridges only takes up as much space as four Cricut case boxes. But it doesn't look as cute on your shelf. So. Uh, Merle says, sweet 16 in a travel pack will hold your cartridges. And she knows. She's an authority on that. She's a Cricut master. Okay, Amanda says, do you keep your catalog in the particular sections of the system? Um, or do you have the catalog all together in a separate place? So when I'm talking about the catalog, the catalog is all together um, on a binder on my scrap rack. 
So it is with everything that I'm using, but I can also pull that catalog right off the scrap rack and take it with me when I go to shop or I go to a stamping class or whatever so I know what I've got. Now, the catalog works great if you have your stamps, your punches, your Cricut, your nestabilities, all of those things in that one catalog. Because, again, if you're at the store and you want to buy a new Cricut cartridge, you can look and see if you already own that Cricut cartridge or you own something similar to it. So it doesn't just work for stamps, as I talked about earlier. It works for everything. So if you've got a lot and you have that, that catalog is a great way to go. And if you're working on Halloween, you just go to the catalog section of your scrap rack and look at your Halloween and you see your stamps, your punches, you know, nestabilities if that's appropriate, and Cricut if that's appropriate, whatever it is. Um, so you have that great cross-reference. Now, I also know that there are got a lot who have who make a Halloween section for their catalog. And the same time they're making the, that Halloween section, they make a second Halloween section. So they're doing it all at the same time. And um, then when they're done making the catalog, they put one set of sheets into the catalog finder, and they put the other set of Halloween sheets right into Halloween. So if you're going to do that, um, make dual catalogs, obviously you're going to want to do both catalogs at the same time. So it's really easy and really fast and everything goes together and that's a simple way to do it. You don't want to start creating a second catalog later. I hope that answers your question, Amanda. Glenda asks, I don't know what the T means, but she has them divided between font and shape cartridges. Yeah, you know what I think it is? I think it was themes. That's what it, that's what it was. It was themes on that um, so the ones with the T were cricket themes, like birthday party or travel or whatever, and the other one was alphabet. So that's I'm sure, I'm sure now that that's what it means. Oh, look, and Jenny says cricket theme. Cr CT on the boxes equals cricket themes. There we go. A couple of different responses by what are just read down the page. Um, Merle also says that embellishment pages and the travel pack work well for transporting your cricket cartridges around, too. Uh, another good idea. Stephanie asks, love the idea of storing the Cricut cartridges on Velcro on a divider. The overlays would work well in the scrap rack page behind it. Uh, yes, they would. And I think, I'm not sure the exact dimensions of the Cricut um, overlays, but I'm wondering if they wouldn't fit like perfectly into the Fab Four. I don't know. Merle, you, Merle, you might have your overlays in Cricut in scrap rack pages, so if you do, and tell us what page size they fit in. I mean, I guess I could get up and walk over to my little area here and check too. So I'll have to look at that as well. But yeah, and if you so if you don't need the books especially, it's really easy to take the cartridges and the overlays. Uh, Debbie says, "Thanks, you answered my question during the seminar. This has been great." Amanda says, "If you are able to put the actual items into the scrap rack, do they still need to go in the catalog?" Um. Yes and no. I would strongly recommend creating the catalog if you're a got a lot. Um, one of the big benefits to the catalog is that it really helps you make better choices about what to buy. Um, I used the example of the heart stamp, right? So you know that you have a tiny heart stamp and a large heart stamp. Um, and if you have that catalog when you're shopping, then you know that you need a medium heart stamp. You don't end up buying something else. Um, if you're a got a little, and you have that, um, you know, you're able to put the heart stamp right into Valentine's Day, then you don't really need the catalog. So more, um, more, who, who are you? Are you got a little or you got a lot? Um, are you somebody in the middle? If you're, if you think that you love stamps or you love cricket or whatever, and you think that you're going to grow in that, then I would strongly recommend that you do the catalog, um, as well so that you have um, that going, so you don't have to go back and create it later. So especially, you know, some people start stamping, get really addicted to stamping, and they just buy tons of stamps for cards and pages and all kinds of crafts that they're using. So if you have that love, that passion for a particular thing especially, um, then you want to go ahead and start the catalog as well. I hope that helps. Are there pictures of people's catalogs on the organization page? Yes, there are. I know several people have posted up their catalog sheets. Um, on the organization page. So um, if you go back and look at the pictures there. Also, if you're somebody who's redoing the um, webinar right now and you've posted your pictures before, if you go ahead and repost them so they pop up fresh for people, that would be great. But yeah, there are quite a bit. 
Karen says, does it matter which direction rubber stamps on wooden blocks are stored? No, it does not matter whatsoever. So I would stand them up and number the edges so they take up the least amount of space and they're the most visible. What is the best way to store unmounted stamps? I know this is going to be a shock to all of you, but I store my unmounted stamps right in the pages of my scrap rack. Um, I don't think that it matters how you store them. I guess I'm not a particular authority on them as long as they're protected um, from, you know, being dried out or, um, you know, if they're right in direct sunlight, they might might dry out the acrylic and it might crack or, or get, you know, little grooves in it or whatever. But I just put mine right into scrap wrap pages. I know close to my heart comes in a plastic, um, you know, folder that snaps closed, so, you know, that's a fine way to store them, but in terms of do they need to be upright or flat, none of that really matters. It more matters that they're not somewhere where they're going to be exposed to extreme heat or extreme cold because I think that would be hard on the acrylic itself. If somebody else has a different opinion on that, please feel free to post it on the, um, on the group. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but I've never read, seen, heard, or been told anything different, I guess. Joanna or Jana says, could you put up the screen with your code on it again? I certainly can. And I, and I will as well um, post that. Oh, she said code. I think she's talking. I'm assuming that you're talking about these codes right here. But if you're talking about the coupon code, um, I'll put that up too. So if someone wants to keep on code, let me know. But I will send that out via email. So you have a few days to decide if you want to take advantage of that as well. Um, do you put little price tag type stickers on your die stamps, et cetera, or do you write on them with indelible marker? I write on them. Um, I know some people use little stickers or labeling guns or labeling tools, um, like a brother labeler or whatever, but I just write on everything with the Sharpie. Uh, Marla asks, have you decided what you are doing for the 2,000 fans on Facebook. I'm chumming up the bits, place in order. Or are you going to want to wait, Marla, until the second because you, I'm assuming that if you didn't, that you must have jumped in just a few minutes late. I'll go back. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. I'll go back to that um, screen. Well, I'm going to leave this screen up for another minute with the codes on it. Okay, I'm going the wrong way, I think. Um, and then I'll go back to the code with the coupon code for that, for that 20% off for, for oops, can't talk and click at the same time. 20%, you're going to get 20% off, and the person who pushes us over $2,190 in sales during that sale is going to get their order up to $219 of it for free. So I'll post that, put that screen back up in just a minute. Um, Valerie asks, because this is my first live webinar, I seem to be muted. Is there an easy fix? No. Only I get to talk at the webinar. <laughs> Everybody's muted so that people aren't talking over each other. So we just use this question and answer time to um, be able to ask questions, and I can respond there. People can post other things. Um, Denise asks, is the nine blade cutting tool a scrap rack item and qualifies? To use the 20%. No, it is not a scrap rack item. I'm sorry. We only we can only afford the discount things that we have a little bit more margin on, so our own products. So no, those are not included. Now, um, other products are included in other sales. Um, I know when we do the um, like we did Black Friday, it was free shipping, and that included anything that you bought on the website. So sometimes they are included, and sometimes not. Dale asks. I never would have thought of using 12 by 12 for indexing my items. That's a great idea, as it would be easier to stack carry with my 12 by 12 products. I nearly never use 8.5 by 11. So, yeah, absolutely. If you want the 12 by 12 format, and all of us have 12 by 12 paper that we're probably never going to use. So whether it's a funky color or, it's, um, you know, the edge has been destroyed from too much sunlight or whatever, or it's dirty or you know, see, or you think the color is ugly now, you can use all of that 12 by 12 paper that is colors that you want normal, you won't use again, whatever, to make those catalog sheets. So, I also know people who created their whole catalog using the pocket pages so that they have, um, 
they have examples of the stamps that they can take right out of the pocket page in, within the catalog. So if you're somebody who likes that idea of being able to have that exact stamp with the cutout around it, you, you, you want to create a catalog right in the pocket pages, you can put one impression each direction so that you get like a double use out of the page. I did mine just on 12 by 12 paper them. Um, Sandy asks, to join the challenge for the weekly gift, do you need to post that week's challenge or do you post whatever you are working on at the time? You just need to post your progress, Sandy. So it could be that particular week's challenge, could be some other um, week's challenge. It's just more of a way for you to stay accountable that you are on track and that you are working and that you did get something done um, that in, within that week's time. And again, if you're not part of the Facebook group, you can email me. I get probably um, a half a dozen or a dozen emails a week from people sort of updating me on my progress and those things all go into the drawing um, for the winner every week. Janice asks, talking about taking the catalog with you, I tend to buy the same paper twice because I don't remember I have it in a particular theme paper. What do you suggest? Um, hmm. It says Janice has left. Um, I suggest that you stop buying paper. <laughs> no, that's probably not a good answer, right? Um, you know, if there if there tends to be something, if if you're shopping for scrapbooking supplies, I would take that whole section with me. So if I'm going to work on beach pages, I'm going to pull my spinder that seems to be off my scrap rack and take it with me when I go to the scrapbook store. So my papers are in there. My embellishments are in there. Everything I have for that theme is in there. So two things happen. One, you, you don't buy things that you already own. You buy things that complement what you already own um, rather than duplicate it, which I guess you hear me say all the time. The other thing is you buy more you buy more smartly. Is that the right word? I'm not sure. But so if you are going to do six pages of beach layout and you want the same background paper on all six pages, if you have your whole section with you and you only have four of those of that background paper that you want to use, then you know you need to buy two more of that background paper or you need to buy something different so that you have six sheets that all match. So being able to take that section with you, whether you're taking it, you know, off your scrap rack or you're taking your Ziploc bag or you're taking your file folder or however you have it, that ability to take it with you when you're shopping is really key. So I know Janice has left, but my advice is, if you're going shopping for something particular, then um, take that section with you. If you're just going shopping to be shopping, then take your camera phone with you and pick, take pictures of the things you like. And when you get home, you can kind of compare them with what you've got, and then you can go back and buy them. As you know, I'm not an advocate of overbuying. So this kind of slows down the process and makes you think about what you're purchasing instead of just impulsively buying it. And the other option is to buy it and then return it so um, but again if you bought at a show or whatever then that that might not be as much of an option but I think being able to take the section with you that you're shopping for is really going to help um, Glenda says I'm right there with you Merle I think I'm a got a 99.99 percent of everything now uh, let's see can you take a picture of an entire sheet and just putting this sheet in your catalog rather than each stamp separately? Absolutely. That's exactly what I would do because stamps are going to, I think she's asking about like if you have an entire set of stamps, like the Stampin' Up stamps, right, where I have the chef and the Bon Appetit and then the birthday things, you put that picture of that whole set in everywhere so that you don't have to cut them apart or separate them and then you know what else is in that set. So yeah, I would definitely say so. Lori asks, how do you uh, how do you store your shape punches, circles, etc.? I just have a section in my scrap rack that's actually called shapes. There's all kinds of things that, um, you know, there are circles or squares or that we cut out circles or squares or punch out circles or squares. And so I just have a shape section in my scrap rack, and that's where all of those things are. Um, Lynn says, I have all of my small physics dice in a sweet 16. When I turn the page, the top row wants to fall out. Would it work? okay to tape the flaps down or is there a better solution um you know just from the weight of those Sizzix dies I know that some people use tape and some people have um, put like little velcro tabs that go over um onto that it's a little bit expensive but if you're going to use it for Sizzix you know 
in the long haul, then it's definitely worth the investment. Just You're right, the weight of them in that Sweet 16, and maybe you only need to do the top row, actually, now that you're saying that, that's probably true. The only thing you need to do would be the top row. So that, um, that might be a great solution. We may come out with a, a heavier page um, for things like Sizzix dies and, and the heavier weight of things as well. Those are all things that are part of that um, new products group. So if you have a suggestion about that, please feel free to put it in there. Glenda says, so using your catalog numbering, this will also prevent me from having to pull stamp sets apart, which I had started to do. Absolutely, Glenda, it will, it, it's, it, you're right, you got it, you're, you nailed it. Uh, Denise says, where do generic type journaling spots fit in your system, like rectangles or squares with specific design? So again, um, you might have that in that shapes section of your scrap rack or your four section system under, minor under F for shapes. So I have circles and squares and frames and banners. And I'm trying to think what else um, is in there. I don't really have triangles. But I have stars in there. Um, I have hearts in there. And um, so all of those things can work right into that shape section. Now, if you have journaling specific things, like there's a lot of journaling stamps out there or journaling, um, I don't know, other journaling things, you could just have a section either in shapes or under journaling. And for me, it would be actually in the alphabet section. Um, anything that I have that's like a journaling block or a journaling tool or I have journaling templates, those are all in my ABC section. Um, and just because when I think of journaling, I think of writing letters. And so the, all my journaling stuff is right in that um, alphanumeric section of my scrap rack. So how you think about it is going to be key because you want to remember that you have it and you want to use it. So you may have it under shapes, but you may also have it under alphabets or under um, a section J for journaling so that you can get there easily. Um, Merle says, the very back of the Cricut books now show every image that can be cut from the cartridge. So if you're going to copy something, copy the very back of the Cricut book and put it in each section. Monica asks, thank you for showing us how to organize stamps, punches, inks, and other ways to use color. I didn't get into stamping and colors because I knew how big they get. Now that I have the knowledge to organize everything, I feel like I can utilize those techniques without fear of them taking over, and I'll be able to enjoy them. So good for you, Monica, for not just um, for knowing well enough that you could easily bury yourself in all the goodies that come with stamping and sort of staying away from that. And one of the nice things about this whole class, the, the webinar, is but anything you're going to take on in your life, whether you're going to become a quilter or a sewer or do some other kind of art, you can apply all of these ideas when you first start. So anything new that you're going to take on, you can start by saying, okay, like Monica, if I'm going to do this, how am I going to keep it organized? How am I going to keep control of it? Well, now you have this sort of foundation of organization that you can apply to everything from you know, organizing your linen closet to taking on quilting or some other big other craft like Monica, like stamping. So um, good job for you, Monica, to be thinking ahead. You know, one of the things that happens, and especially I, I talk about this in the live seminars a lot, is that when we first start scrapbooking, we think that we have to have everything and we just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate because there was no system when we first started it just all became overwhelming. So from this point forward, moving into anything new, um, hopefully your brains are retrained now to before you jump in to think, okay, before I get buried, I need a plan for how I'm going to take care of organizing and store this stuff. So, uh, Denise says, regarding Cricut cartridges, go to the internet to pull up that product. Usually has a view to see what's inside, then print the entire page. So you can do it on the internet. One of the things about doing it on the internet as well is that you can use something like um, OneNote, which is the notebook program that comes with Microsoft Office. And so you can start a Cricut notebook uh, in OneNote on your computer. And then if you have a smartphone, you can sync that notebook, OneNote, with your smartphone. Um, you can do, you can actually create the whole catalog, this whole catalog in OneNote if you want to scan all of your other things into your computer. And then you can sync your OneNote catalog with your phone. So when you're shopping, again, you have that all that information on your phone. So, um, and uh, as Denise was saying, 
pulling those images off the internet and putting them into a virtual notebook on your computer um, is really fast and really easy. I would strongly recommend that if you're, pull, if you're taking the time to pull those images that you organize them on your computer as well. Kim says, my clear stamps are on a printed backing page in order to see clearly. How does the stamp caddy work with these sheets? And I think when you're talking about the stamp caddy, I'm not sure if you're talking about the um, about using the photo storage box or using the scrap rack pages. But with the printed stamps that I have, um, that background, I put that background sheet right into my scrap rack pages so that you can really see um, what those stamps are. So if you just put the printed sheet right in with the stamps in the scrap rack page, you're going to be able to see those. I, I, I'm not sure if that really answered your question, though, Kim. So if I wasn't clear or that wasn't really what you were asking, please resubmit. Colleen says, or there are subcategories, different sizes, spell binders, physics, et cetera. Should the numbers go 1 through 100 no matter what the brand, or should the brands each start with a 1? Um, so I use codes um, like WB for woodblock or SV for civics, and I started everything with 100. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I'm sure it made sense to me at the time. And I think it's because when you, if you were going to do anything on the computer, um, it's easier not to have single digit numbers. I don't remember what I was thinking at the time, but there was a method to my madness. So starting everything with 100, um, but I don't remember the exact reason. I know I started the labeling of the stamps with the pocket size and, and so that I knew what section that that stamp was going to go in in terms of size. But I would definitely start with a code. And again, I would start with codes if you know you're going to buy more stuff, right? The codes um, really are going to carry forward very nicely and make it very easy. So if you have multiple kinds of things, I would definitely start use the codes to start with. Denise asks, what is the width and depth of an open single spinder scrap rack? planning a new scrap room and have not been able to find this on the website. So the base unit itself is 15 inches long by 13 inches deep by 7 inches high. The metal back of it is 7 inches high. Um, so that's what you need in terms of table space to set it on. And then each of the wings adds 11 inches. So you need, 11, you need 37 inches for a single base unit um, wherever you're going to put it. Um, but you only need a footprint of 13 and a half by 15 and a half to set the base on, if that makes sense. And I think that that those details, if you if you, I think they're under the basic. And if they're not, I'm going to make a note of that um, measurement, and I'm going to get that on the website because that's um, I know it used to be on there, but we've changed so many things that it might it might not measurement the basic. Sorry, I'm taking a minute to write a note here on the website. Okay. So I'll get that added. I'll try and get it added with um, some drawings around it that show it so people understand what I'm talking about when I say all those are broken up. A more Ashby. I think you're a long way away somewhere. I saw a post. It's 100 degrees where you are. I wish I was there right now. It's 40 here. Uh, Amor says, thanks a lot here. I thought I was. I will cruise through this week's challenge. Not so after tonight. Been thoroughly enjoying every week, and I hope you are helped helping that ship along from your side as I cannot wait for my travel pack to arrive. Hopefully it's well on its way, Omar. Glenda says, for the cricket, if you belong to the cricket message board, there are folks who have done the work for you in that they've created a couple of different sizes. Uh, for example, the back of the cartridge box, so you can just print each of those out. So you can have an example for each cartridge and store those in a binder or however you're storing. So the cricket message boards. I know um, Merle, uh, and her name is spelled M-Y-R-E-L, is a cricket um, expert. So I'm sure she's on the message board. So she might have access to that if you want to bother her on the Facebook page. She might be able to set you up. Debbie asks, I have a box set with four sections. Is it best to take these stamps and split them up into my theme stamps or leave them in their own box since I have no more space on my shelves? This is a double problem for me. Thanks for the ideas. Um, I'm not sure I understand the whole question, so 
uh, if this doesn't answer it, then you can come back and repost. So um, I have a box set with four sections. So whatever those stamps are, you want to stamp them out or photocopy them and put examples of them into wherever they belong in your four-section system. And then if you want to leave them in that box, in that storage box, you just need to make a note on each of the impressions that says, you know, this stamp is located in this box. So that when you see the impression, it doesn't matter if you have Christmas stamps and Easter stamps and birthday stamps in that box, in that four-section box, your, your example in your four-section system is going to direct you to the box where you're going to find those stamps. So that's really the key. I hope that helps. Um, Merle says Stampin' Up! sells the empty clam shells, and she thinks they're less than they are at Michael's or Joanne's. So if you have a Stampin' Up! rep, um, I'm sure they can help you with that, it sounds like. Iris asks, if I have no names or numbers on some items, where can I find them so I have the proper names for them? Thank you so much for all your help. This is really helping me, Iris. Usually you can find that kind of information on the Internet if you don't have a name or number. So I'm assuming that you're thinking that you have a set of stamps that doesn't have a name on it or a number. But here's the thing. You can give it your own name and your own number, right? So if you have a set of stamps that's birthday stamps and they're flowery, whatever, you could just, if you want to give them a name, you can just call them flowery birthday stamps, put them wherever they belong, you know, whatever, wherever they pop up numerically, add that number to them, and now you've got a number for them. Um, other than that, I, if you want, like, the manufacturer number or something, then I'm sure you can find it on the Internet, um, especially if it's something like Stampin' Up! or Close to My Heart, um, you'll be able to find it that way. Linda says, regarding clamshells, I know some folks on the Cricut message boards have ordered them in bulk somewhere online. Same for the DVD cases. There are lots of people using them to store stamps. Lots of these things have been found online. If you own a Cricut and don't already belong to the Cricut message board, you're missing out on a plethora of any type of help you might ever want regarding crafting and not just for Cricut. So if you're a Cricut user, you might want to join the message board, even if you're just a lurker. Linda asks, where does the catalog go on the scrap rack, just in the front? Um, mine is in the very front, but truthfully, um, it could go anywhere that's convenient for you. So in the very front or in the middle, I know my sister puts hers right in the middle because most it's, it's the thing she uses the most, so she doesn't have to flip all the way to the front. So mine's in the front because that's how my – brain works. I can't disrupt my pattern by putting something in the middle. That's not part of my four section system. But really putting it in the middle makes the most sense in terms of usability of it. So mine's in the front, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best place for it. Um, Merle says the uh, the overlays for the Cricut are almost seven inches by almost three, so they will fit in the four in a row, but with wasted Space. Now, with that said, we're doing a new page um, as a recommendation from somebody on the new product message board that has three long pockets on it. The four in a row that Merle mentioned we don't have any more, and mostly because those border pockets people thought were a little bit too thin. So we're going to bump that up and do a three in a row pocket. And then it sounds like that would be the perfect fit for the overlays. And I bet you could put the cartridge in the end of that if you're and using the hot tool as well. So I'm going to write that down. We may you may see a cricket storage pocket um, from us in the summer. Now that I'm, now that I'm talking about that, see what a good brainstorming session this is for me. You guys think I'm just a teacher, but I'm learning as I go. Um, Monica says, I'd recommend putting your wish list at the back of your catalogs. I have been forgetting to get a scallop punch for a year. Now, I've been forgetting to get a scallop punch for a year now. If I carry my catalog into Michael's, I'll remember if I have the wish list with me. That's a great um, suggestion, Monica. Um, so if you, at the back of your catalog, put that wish list or put some empty, um, maybe even just 8.5 by 11 page protectors. So if you're um, going through your new Creating Keepsake magazine and you see a product that you want, really want to, check out the next time you're at Michael's or the scrapbooking store. Not only could you use this for stamps or punches or whatever that you want, you could pull that ad right out of the magazine and throw it in that pocket. And then when you're at the scrapbook store, you can go to somebody that works there and says, hey, do you have this new product? Or 
can you bring it in or do you know anything about it or whatever. But again, it would just remind you. Now, one of the things about magazines that we don't talk too much about is that they're expensive. And when you just leave them on the shelf and you don't tear them apart, you don't really get the full value of them. So if you take your magazine, like pull out those ads, or if there's layout and design ideas that you like, pull out those layout and design ideas and start a section in your catalog for design ideas and throw that um, section in, in there or, you know, different techniques or whatever. So you really can use the catalog or a, or a couple of finders on a strap rack for, you know, design ideas, for, um, you, know, you know, there's always those things about how to make really cute things out of punches for those punch ideas. So you can literally take some of your scrap rack and use it as your own giant idea book as well, which is something that I haven't always talked a lot about. Um, I may put together a little video on creating your own design idea book um, using just, you know, a spinder and some page protectors on your scrap rack. Great suggestion, Mon. Um Jenny says, Tim Holtz has made a really cool binder for storing the unmounted stamps. I love Tim Holtz products. So I haven't seen that, but Tim Holtz comes up with great stuff. So definitely worth, worth looking into. Glenda says, will you email out the list of codes you use, such as, yes, I will. Um, email codes. I'm writing another note here. So I'll get that out with today's or this afternoon's email. Uh, Dana says, sorry, I think I missed how would you number an alphabet stamp set? Each letter as one number. No, I would not. Um, because you're going to keep that set of alphabet stamps together. So I would just call it, you know, depending on what brand it is, whatever. Um, and then, and then you can just put that whole sample. Now, here's the other thing. You don't necessarily need a whole sample of that alphabet, right? A, B, C, and one, two, three. If you just stamp out those, and put them in your um, catalog or in your four-section system, you're going to have the basic feel of the alphabet and the basic size of it. So if you stamp it out and then and you're at a crop and you decide you want to use that stamp set to make a title or something, you know the basic size of the letters. And you could build the title bar. Again, put the sticky note on that says when you get home, you know, stamp out happy birthday in blue ink on this title bar or whatever. But um, I would just put... A, B, C, and one, two, three of each of those stamp sets in the um, alphabets and numbers section. Uh, Tina says, I joined in late. Can I view the previous webinar somewhere? You can, Tina. Um, you should get an email from me this afternoon that has a link back to the previously recorded webinars. Um, and this one will be at the bottom. They're, they go in order by presentation date. So the first one is top, and this one will be at the bottom. Um, so, yes, you can go back and um, check that out. Okay, I'm scrolling through here. I hope I'm not skipping anybody. The only issue with using 12 by 12 paper is that it's not easy to find 12 by 12 binders. What I've done is bought for three ring scrapbooks on sale, even if they're ugly. It doesn't matter because you can always alter them with vinyl, etc. And if you end up with canvas material, you can paint on it or use Claudine uh, Helmut sticky back canvas in 12 by 12 size to decorate and then cover the front and back so it doesn't look so ugly. You know, one of the other things that's really come on the um, the new product thing is this demand for a 12 by 12 notebook made out of a lightweight plastic like our divider plastic or something similar. So that is one of the things also that we're looking at um, creating and bringing um, this spring, I mean this summer. So you may see that lightweight, easy to use 12 by 12 notebook with a Velcro spinder, with a Velcro spinder on the inside of it. So um, you can use it just as a notebook or you can use the cover to take just your catalog with you or move the spinders around or whatever. But you, you're probably going to see that 12 by 12 really basic notebook from us as long as we can manufacture it at a price that's, that's reasonable. Patricia's ahead of the grain because she cataloged almost all her punches during the webinar. Good job, Patricia. Way to go. I love it when people are working and listening at the same time. That makes me feel so good. Okay, Glenda says, how can we store templates such as Crafters Workshop, 6 by 6, 12 by 12, journaling, genie templates, tattered angels templates, etc. I have lots of these, and I'm not sure what to do with them. Um, so templates usually um, are a size that's going to fit into a pocket page. Now, I have um, some templates that are already freehold punched, and um, and so they'll just go on right onto a binder. So you could literally put all your templates together if you wanted them together. 
Now, usually templates are shape, are journaling, are something very specific. So uh, my journaling templates are right in the front of my scrap rack with my journaling example to journaling stamp and then alphanumeric. All the journaling and writing things tie it into my brain in the alphanumeric section, that first section. So that's where mine are. But in your shape section, you might have a journaling section that would have the stamps and the journaling templates. Um, you might have all your star templates in there or your round templates or whatever shape templates that you've got. I would recommend, I used to put my templates just using a three-hole punch and putting them directly on there. But because they're kind of wonky, you know, they they hook on to each other or whatever. So now I just put the whole template into a, a pocket page. The other thing is when you three -hole, when you use a three-hole punch and put them on right on your spinder, you have to take your spinder off your base unit, lay it down, open it up to take the template off. If you put the template right into a storage page, then you can pull it out of the storage page without having to take it off the temp uh, off the spinder. So now anything that I get or once I use it and take it off the spinder, it goes back into a storage page. So, But even if you're not using a scrap rack, um, putting your templates into a scrap, depending on the size, either you know if they're big into a scrap rack page or if they're smaller into a page protector, and even standing them up in like a paper storage box um, that way, when they're in that plastic sheeting, they don't get hung up and stuck on each other. And you can also label the edges so you know what's in each one of those things. I'm going to have a little note here about template um, illustration. So I won't get to that today, I'm sure, but I'll try to get some information up on the website about kind of how to deal with those templates. I hope that helps. Kim says, I was talking about the scrap accessory stamp caddy I saw on your website. Um, I don't think that was on our website, Kim. I'm so sorry. I don't know. I might look it up though. I'm gonna I'm gonna write down that name, scrap accessory, and see what that is because it might be something we should have on our website if we think it's a great tool for organizing scrap accessory stamp caddy. I'll check it out. Um, Glenda says, can you please include the dimensions for the scrap rack base and the wings in the email? Yes. Um, I'm going to write that right on the email, email codes, and scrap rack dimensions. I'll put it all, I'll put it all on there for you ladies today. Glenda says, the only time you have to worry about having accurate product codes and naming is if you're submitting something for publication. That's a good point. So if you're somebody that wants to be on a design team or is on a design team or is submitting to the magazine, then it's important that you know exactly what products that you use. So and that should be um, why that other question was important. Valerie asked, I may have missed it, couldn't get in on at the beginning, but have you discussed die cut machines? I have a lot of Cizik dies and much and such, most of which are now in the proprietary cloth boxes or case findings from Cizik, which I like. If I catalog them and identify the box location, will that follow essentially idea? Absolutely, Valerie. So if you have a a box of Cizik dies already, I would number the dies and number the box so that you know exactly if you're looking for number 50 and you have a box of 100, you know you can go back to the middle, 48, 49, 50, and there it is. When you use it, you know exactly where to put it back. So just so long as your, your goal is to tie, to go, to see that thing in your catalog and then be able to go and get it quickly and easily and when you're done using it, be able to put it back quickly and easily. So you're right on track. Shelly says, um, you were selling the scrap and tote Cricut storage sheets. They can be used in the scrap rack. They can be used in the scrap rack. We don't have them anymore, but you can buy them online. The only reason that we don't carry them is, is that they are so expensive. So you may see something similar, what I was just brainstorming with as I was talking here about that Cricut, you know, putting your, your uh, overlays into the new three pocket page, it's like between the four in a row and the double X, it's three pockets for borders. And um, I may have uh, segment that off so you can put your cartridge in one um, in the end of the pocket and then it'll be another. So it'll actually be a six pocket page, just a different configuration designed to hold those cricket cartridges. We're going to see if I can't get that done for summer. Uh, you mentioned the Cricut message board. Is this on Facebook or how do I get to one? So can somebody on the on the Cricut message boards post a link on our Get Organized Challenge page, please, um, to how to get to the Cricut message boards and then 
if somebody's listening to me now and you're not a Facebooker but you want information, you can email me and I'll find that link on Facebook and um, post it back to you. I am not a member of those boards, but I know many of you are. Barbara asks, this is my first time here. It is great. Thank you. <laughs> I have a very messy craft room. This is the perfect way to start. Thank you. You're so welcome, Barbara. We're excited that you're here. If you're not part of the Facebook group, we strongly encourage you to join that motivational, inspirational, and humorous group of uh, organizers. It's a great way to stay focused. So please feel free to join us there on Facebook. If you don't get an email from me this afternoon, it's because we don't. Um, I don't have your email address, but you do. So again, you can email us at customer service if you don't get the email. Now, I have a lot going on today because I've been out of town, so it may take me till later in the day to get that email out. But if you haven't seen it by tomorrow morning, you should definitely have it. So email me and let me know, and I'll make sure we update your uh, email address. Dorothy says, oh, Dorothy says, instead of um, punching out ABC and 123, you could punch out the name of the alphabet. So that would be a cute way to, um, to do that as well and give you that same example of, the shapes and sizes of those letters. How can I hear or read the Q&A if I miss them? Um, you can hear the Q&A when we post the uh, recorded video, the recorded webinar. You just have to skip to the end and start listening. Um, Kim says, I'm sorry, I finally lost my mind. Well, I hope you find it, Kim, when you're organizing your scrapbook room. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Please let us know next. Merle says, baseball card holder pockets will hold your Sizzix die cuts and they won't fall out. Then, of course, they fit perfectly into your scrap rack. So, baseball card, called, card holders um, are uh, available, too, everywhere from Target to Walmart or whatever because they're not quite so niche -y. They're probably a little bit less expensive because they're not dealing with such a niche market. So, great suggestion, Merle. Um, Linda says, to get to the Cricut board, you can go to cricut.com and then click on forum or message board. Uh, Lori also says um, to get on the boards, go to the Cricut site, and you can lurk or sign up to post. And our last post for the day is from Merle. Also, I have a question about taking the foreign language pages out of the Cricut book. The spiral will still be the same size, so it doesn't make it smaller unless I'm not understanding uh, what is totally possible. I think the difference is that when you start stacking them up, you can put um, the spiral at the top and then the spiral of the other one at the bottom so they so they overlap. And so that allows, because there's half as many pages, you'll still be able to get more books in. But you can't stack the spirals up all on the same edge. So spiral up, spiral down, spiral up, spiral down would be how you have to do it. And that was kind of bug me because I like all my stuff to be going the same direction. but it would work. Uh, Glenda says, um, you have to create a Cricut ID to be able to post on the board. Um, and Jean says, before I took out the foreign pages, I could not fit everything in my art bin, and now I can. Uh, and Merle, ah, oh, Merle has had an ah, uh, not an aha moment, but just an ah uh, moment. Darn it. I was hoping to get the aha uh -huh in for somebody today. All right, so we are at the end of our session today, the end of questions, the end of posting. I will um, work as hard and fast as I can to get this email out earlier rather than later. But like I said, if you don't see it until first thing tomorrow morning or very late tonight, um, don't worry. It's, it, is, it will be on its way. So thanks so much, everybody. Um, oh, Barbara says, you have my aha moment. So <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear it. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, please feel free to email me or you know post on the Facebook group if you have questions. I know this is kind of a heavy um, webinar topic. So everybody have a great and productive week, and we will meet back here again next week and talk about getting to a prop or class with your newly organized stuff. All right, take care, and I will talk at you next Tuesday. <laughs>